to History Class with Dr. W in our continuing discussion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. In the previous lectures, we've talked about one of the figures who overshadowed this era in a major way, Teddy Roosevelt. In this lecture, we'll talk about his successor in the White House, William Howard Taft, and eventually the election of 1912. For the 1908 presidential election, Teddy Roosevelt handpicked his own successor, his friend William Howard Taft. He could have hardly have chosen a man more different from himself, though Taft had served as a valuable and trusted advisor. He served as the governor of the Philippines and then as Roosevelt's secretary of war. Taft was enormous, somewhere between 300 and 350 pounds. He was physically lazy, while Roosevelt was boisterous. And he disliked foreign affairs. He enjoyed domestic issues, and especially the law, which was his specialty. But foreign affairs were too unpredictable and messy for Taft. His dislike of diplomacy would cost him, which we've mentioned briefly in previous lectures, and we'll mention again when we discuss World War I in a future lecture. With Roosevelt's backing, Taft rolled to a landslide victory over William Jennings Bryan in the 1908 presidential election. Taft lacked the force of personality and the political skill of his predecessor, and he struggled to keep his party unified between the progressive and conservative factions. Taft alienated progressives, for instance, when he signed the Payne-Aldrich tariff, which raised tariff rates. And he further angered progressives when he fired Gifford Pinchot, a leading environmentalist and the nation's chief forester. Pinchot had criticized Taft's appointee as Secretary of the Interior, Richard Ballinger, whom Pinchot suspected would not support Roosevelt's environmental initiatives. The firing of Pinchot only further alienated the progressive wing of the Republican Party. At the same time, Taft did support many progressive initiatives, including Roosevelt's efforts at trust-busting, which he only accelerated. In fact, Taft broke up twice as many trusts in his term as president than Roosevelt had done. Taft also limited the workday of federal employees to eight hours and supported the 16th Amendment of the Constitution, which empowered Congress to levy a federal income tax. He created a Children's Bureau and supported the 17th Amendment, which allowed for the direct election of senators by the people. Still, Taft's mixed record left the door open for others to challenge for the presidency in 1912, including Roosevelt himself. The 1912 election is one of the most unique in American history. Teddy Roosevelt returned to the fray to run an energetic third-party campaign as the candidate for the Progressive Party, known in this election as the Bull Moose Party, because, as Roosevelt said, he felt as strong as a bull moose. It wasn't an easy decision for Roosevelt to challenge his one-time friend and his hand-picked successor, Taft, for the presidency in 1912. But as noted previously, Roosevelt questioned Taft's mixed record, particularly in supporting progressive reforms and the progressive platform. And Roosevelt believed he would be better to run the country as president and that he could do a better job with his progressive initiatives than Taft had done. But there are also those who question Roosevelt's decision as simply the act of an egomaniac and one who couldn't keep himself out of the fray. But whatever the motives, Roosevelt certainly threw a wrench into the 1912 presidential election, as few other third-party candidates have ever done. Roosevelt's platform during this election was what he called a new nationalism, a broad plan of social reform in America that echoes many of the progressive reforms we've been talking about for most of this course. It was a broadly progressive program 
that called for workers' compensation, child labor laws, and a minimum wage. It also called for some kind of pension for old age citizens and helping Americans with health care costs. He also supported women's suffrage. Many of these actions were well before their time in American history. Taft and others within the party didn't agree with much or all of what Roosevelt was arguing, and so the Republican side was split in its vote. That left the door open for the Democratic candidate to win this election. The Democratic nominee, Woodrow Wilson, benefited from the rift in the Republican Party, winning a plurality of the vote and winning the election with only 42% of the popular vote. Wilson was the son of a Presbyterian minister, a religious and powerfully intellectual man. He had been the president of Princeton University and had written a widely acclaimed doctoral thesis in the relatively new field of political science. He was a Virginian. He had stood on the roof of his home in Atlanta when Sherman army, Sherman's armies marched through, and thus he was the only American president to know what it was like to lose a war, the Civil War in the South. As he later said, When I go to the South, nothing need be explained to me. From those experience, he grew very cautious about entering a war, which would certainly serve him as World War I began to erupt over in Europe. Wilson was also an Anglophile, meaning that he loved England. He had traveled there as a young man and spent many summers there, considering it a second home. So, again, as the war began to break out in Europe, the United States remained neutral, but Wilson's heart was firmly behind England. While Roosevelt proposed the new nationalism, Wilson proposed the new freedom. He was an admirer of Thomas Jefferson and envisioned a nation of small farmers and small businessmen. Thus his vision for the new freedom involved taking on big businesses and other forms of progressive activity that actually resembled in many ways Roosevelt's own platform. We'll discuss his program a little bit more in the next lecture. It is Wilson who wins the election of 1912 and becomes the next president of the United States, which we'll talk about in the next lecture.